Hey, let's do some practice questions. I feel like doing practice. I love practice questions. All right, so the first one I've got here, which type of access control would be most suitable for a system that stores data of the highest sensitivity level? All right, highest sensitivity. What that makes me think of is something like government, um, secrets, top secrets, national secrets, or within business, secret formulas, secret um, modes of operation, processes, something that we really need to protect within the business. So looking at the answers, what I see is mandatory access control and discretionary access control. It's kind of jump out at me the, kind of immediately. Mac and DAC are two theories that were invented probably before, but the first, first document I know they show up in is the Orange Book, TCSEC um, from 1985. So those are some old terms, but the core theories behind DAC and Mac is DAC is going to be the owner. It allows the owner to say this user needs this level of access to this system or this file or this data. It's all up to the owner or a human would be the way to look at it. A person gets to say this is the level of access that they get. Where mandatory access control is much more complex. You clear the users, so a user would have a secret clearance, top secret clearance, or whatever labels you're using in your business, and then you have to classify every piece of data. And you need a policy that says, if you're this clearance, you're allowed this level of access to that classification. Think Bella Padula or go check that video out. So looking at clearances and classifications, what have we cleared a user to be able to see based on background checks and job and need to know. And there's a system that's going to implement or only allow access based on the policy. Human doesn't have to sit down and say, this is the user, this is the level of access, this is the way it's gonna work. It's clearance classification, here's the rules, and the system enforces it. It's very unusual throughout across the planet, it's very unusual to actually have a mandatory access control system because it is complex and expensive. So out of those two, I like Mac better, but there are two other answers. System high and role-based. So Mac and DAC are two core theories. Role-based is probably the most common implementation of DAC or Mac. Role-based is granting access based on your role, whatever your job is. If you can group a whole lot of people into a specific role, then define what the role has access to, life is a lot easier for the administrators. So role-based implementation of DAC or MAC. Most common implementation of role-based is DAC. DAC's the most common. MAC is very uncommon on the planet. Role-based is common. So role-based is actually normally implemented in a DAC environment. DAC or MAC, those are your two choices. That's the theory, DAC or MAC. We have a lot more than traditional DAC says when we're doing role-based, but it's still discretionary access control. So MAC or role-based, I have to go with MAC as the highest sensitivity. But there's still one more answer, system high. System high actually is a real, real thing. System high is when the system and all of the data it contains are the same classification. So if the system is classified top secret and all the data inside the system is top secret, it's system high. If you have a top secret system and a secret piece of data in that system, it's not, it's not, it's not system high. So looking at that, it's not a requirement to have the system and all the data be the same level for the highest sensitivity level as the question's asking. So I'm going to have to go with Mac. Mac is the better answer here. So there's one. Let's try another one. All right. When deploying a voice over internet protocol, VoIP telephone system, the administrator chooses to configure the phone sets that will be in the lobby or reception area of the business with very limited functionality. What type of access control system is the administrator employed? All right. So here we go. So we have rule based. Careful. It's not role. Read very carefully. It's just a half a letter difference. ACLs, access control list, constrained in content dependent. Rule-based, the best example probably is firewalls. All the rules that we create in a firewall where it, when a packet comes in, match it to the top rule and work your way down through the list of rules. That is going to be um, most common. It's not limiting the functionality. It's making sure that only the right traffic is going to make it past that firewall. So limited functionality, I think, is the key to the question, those two words. ACLs are very common. 
it's not a limited function functionality. You can have a lot of ACLs that actually allow a great level of access. They're a pain to manage, but you can have as many as you want, granted as much access as you want. Content dependent, I jump around. Content dependent access control, best example is probably spam filters. Spam filters are reading the content of the email, looking for specific terms that we know are indications of spam. So that's not, that's not limiting the functionality, that's limiting the emails that get to your inbox, and it's a lot of work. So it doesn't quite match with limited functionality. We're constrained. Every time I say constrained user interface, what I see in my head is a straitjacket. Usually isn't a human in it when I see it in my head, but a straitjacket. If somebody is in a straitjacket, whatever reason, if a user is in a straight or a user, if a person is in a straitjacket, there's not much that they can do. It's often to keep them safe so they can't hurt themselves. We want to constrain the access. So constrained user interfaces actually are going to limit the functionality. Most common example I can give you is probably ATM machines. A lot of them are still running Windows, Windows NT, Windows XP, something. I'm sure there's Windows NT ATM machines somewhere on the planet still in use. If the user had full access on the keyboard at an ATM machine, that's a, there's a lot of danger as far as what could happen. So what we do is we constrain that interface. So you have zero through nine, clear, cancel, enter, pound, or on the screen, you might have some options, checking account, savings account, American, that's what we say, checking, savings, or um, a few other options on the screen. So we're restricting or limiting the functionality. So right answer here, constrained interface. Let's try another one. Which of the following assurance mechanisms is most likely to provide continuous feedback about how well the access control systems are working? Vulnerability review, penetration test, security policy review, and intrusion detection system. All right, keyword in the question I think is continuous. If you want something continuously done, don't get a human. <laughs> If a person has to do the work, they're going to need coffee. I always need more coffee. They're going to need to go get some sleep. They got to get lunch. They are going to answer the telephone. If you need something done continuously, what you need is a computer. Computer doesn't need to take those breaks. With the answers, intrusion detection system, that's going to be a computer. Reviews, reviews are done by people. Vulnerability reviews, policy reviews, that's looking through whatever we have, policies or a list of the vulnerabilities that were found in a vulnerability assessment to determine what are we gonna do about it? Is everything good? Is everything right? Penetration testing is done by penetration testers, humans, that are going to actively try and gain access through the access control mechanisms or through the firewalls, IDSs, IPSs, for all the systems we have on the network to protect ourselves. Pen testers are going to try and get through those to see what hackers could possibly do to our systems. Now, there's computers that could be used for vulnerability assessments and penetration testing, but it's the human that's going to be using it actively through the process of doing the assessment, vulnerability assessment, and a penetration test. The reviews done by humans. So, Sesame Street is your test taking tip here. Which one of these is not like the other? D is a system, A, B, and C are all reliant heavily on people. Excuse me, now IDSs do generate a lot of logs. The logs should be sent to a security information event manager, a SIM or a SIEM, and then it's going to correlate those logs with all the other logs. It generates information like indications of compromise that humans in the security operations center have to access and pay attention to and take actions on. But it was a long distance from IDS logs, seam, security operations, people are gonna review that. So people, yes, are involved in reviewing the logs of an IDS, but it's a, it's a long stretch to get to the people. So IDSs are computers. They're the systems that are gonna be continuously monitoring. Human doesn't have to pay attention to it continuously, just the system is going to be continuously monitoring and creating logs. So best answer here, IDS. All right, let's try another one. What type of testing would be most effective in detecting a rogue wireless access point? It's kind of one of my favorites. Seems like a really easy question if you know what the terms are, but one of these terms is just not that familiar. So 
We're looking for rogue access points. Could be added by a user. They've added a lot over the years. Or it could be added by a hacker or a threat actor trying to gain access to our systems. The first answer, wireless application security testing. Sounds like it's close, but application? I'm looking for an access point that's a device. Yes, it has software, but it's not an application. So there, it it's kind of, sort of, not really. Not quite right. War dialing, that's a very old term. That comes from the movie War Games with Matthew Broderick, 1984. Been, it's been a while. But war dialing is dialing phone numbers looking for modems. So looking for modems, yeah, there's probably some still in use on the planet. Probably a lot in certain areas. But modem and access point are not the same. Now we've taken that term word dialing and we've used it in a lot of other ways. So hold on to that thought. Next one, network penetration. Kind of sounds like a network penetration test, but we're not trying to get through the system. We're not trying to break into the system. We're looking for access points that are on our network that don't belong. So it's not quite right either. So D, we're walking. All right, back to war dialing. We use the word, we've taken that term and we've taken war and used it in other ways like war driving. War driving, driving around town looking for access points, wireless access points. But if we're inside of your business, you're not gonna drive your car around in the floor of the building around inside the cubicles, you walk. <laughs> so you'd actually call it war walking. You can go war boating, war bicycling, war walking, war driving. So anything war with another word is actually looking for wireless networks, something to do with the wireless networks. So war walking is the right term here. Now, if you didn't know war walking you, and you're like, ah, oh, I think war driving is the right term, but war walking, that's weird. But it's not A, it's not B, it's not C. A, B, and C just are not the right answers. War walking's uh, weird, haven't heard the term, kind of close, but I know it's not A, B, or C, it has to be D. So just because you've never heard of a term doesn't mean it's the wrong answer. That is one of my test taking tips for be careful. If you've never heard of it, it's probably not the right answer. But here, A, B, and C are wrong, so it has to be D. It's just a slightly different variation on a term that you do know, war driving. All right, so war walking is the right answer. There you go. There's four more questions. I will see you in the next one. Give me a like, give me a follow. Stay safe. See you in the next one.